Evening everyone and welcome to our final live stream of this year which is going to go through all of those concepts that could potentially come up on the paper 2 for physics which is tomorrow. So what we're going to do as I said in my earlier video is we're actually just going to go through it in order. So what I'll do is any of those topics that are just for either the GCSE physics folks or just higher tier then I will let you know in advance. But in all honesty, there's not a huge amount of that before we get to the very end where they just have that entire little topic at the end, which is just for the physics people. First topic then is all about waves. So hopefully we do remember that when we're talking about waves, we're talking about something that is an oscillation that's going to transfer energy. And what we tend to find are that we've got two types of wave you should know about. So we've got the mechanical waves, which are the ones that need some kind of a medium in order to actually travel. So that's things like sound and water. And then we've also got the electromagnetic waves, which don't need a medium to travel. So what we find is that once we've got our waves, we can divide them up into two categories. They will either be transverse or longitudinal. Now, what we find is that in the transverse waves, this is the little picture that you should be familiar with because when we're talking about a transverse wave then any of those vibrations are going to be at right angles to the direction the wave is traveling in so when you look at your diagram the wave is traveling this way and you can see the vibrations are up and down so they're at right angles to the direction of travel now what we need to be able to do from that is obviously recognize a couple of those key features so the first thing that we've got are the little dips all the way down the bottom are referred to as troughs and the bits all the way at the top, the hilly bits, those are the peaks. So as long as you remember those key facts, you should be okay on the initial parts of our wave. Second type of wave that we've got are longitudinal waves and these are the diagrams you should be familiar with for those. So what we see is the direction travel is the same and what we find the oscillations are going in the same direction. So what we see is you probably had this demonstrated with a slinky in school. So for your actual longitudinal wave, that's where we kind of gave it a little push and then it just got a little bit closer together. And where we actually have those bits that go close together, so these bits, these are the compressions and the bits where it's more spaced out are called the rarefactions. So hopefully that's a little bit familiar to you about our two types of wave there. We do have a few key terms that we should actually know about waves. So we've got the amplitude, first of all, which is the distance from the middle to the top or bottom of the wave, so to the peak or the trough. And that's going to be measured usually in meters. Your wavelength is the distance from one point on the wave to the identical point on the next wave, and that is given in meters. We've got frequency as our third term, which is the number of waves or oscillations per second, and that has the units of hertz. And then the time period is the time for one wave to pass a given point. And that, because it is time, is given in seconds. Now, what we actually find is that when we're looking at these waves, there's two ways that we can actually represent them. We could either show them on what's called a time trace, or we could show it on what's called a snapshot. Now, they're both types of graph that are going to allow us to measure the amplitude because that's always going to be from the middle to either the very top or the very bottom of our wave. So amplitude's the same on both, which is quite nice. But when we then come on to have a look at the time trace and the snapshot for the other features, we get a bit of a difference. Now, the key thing here is when you're looking at the graph, look at what the label on your x-axis is. So because this one has time there, then we know that this is actually our time trace. So what we'll see here is that this is going to show us how the displacement varies with time at any particular position. So what we can do is measure the time period on the time trace. So hopefully that makes sense that if we've got a time trace, you can work out the time period nicely from it. If they were to ask you to calculate the frequency, then sorry, not the frequency, the time period from there, we do one divided by the frequency. The other type of graph that we've got is our snapshot. So snapshot, you'll notice it's got distance on the x-axis there. 
So what we'll see here is on our snapshot is how displacement varies with distance at a particular time. And we can measure the wavelength on this one from any point on a wave to the same point on the next. So depending on which type of graph we've got tells us what we can actually measure. One of those assessed practicals that hopefully you did get demonstrated in school is the good old ripple tank. So we're going to use the ripple tank then to model these different waves and allow us to see what happens in terms of their behavior. So with your ripple tank, this is probably quite like what you saw. It's basically a plastic tray on some legs with the water in there and a little bar that we stick in with a motor that then makes it vibrate up and down. So you get the little waves over the surface. So this is what we're talking about with the ripple tank. Now, if we want to measure the wavelength, first of all, then what we could do is place the ruler in the tank and then literally just look at where the distance is for the two waves, the peak of one, peak of the other, work out what that is and just read it off the ruler directly. Not the easiest thing, as you might imagine, because the waves are moving and you're trying to look through water onto where they're actually coming across. So the second option that we've got is to use a bit of equipment called a stroboscope. Now, a stroboscope is basically like a strobe light. So it's going to flash really quickly. And that means that we pretty much freeze the waves underneath. So by using that, it means that you can freeze them and therefore get the measurement from a ruler much easier. If we wanted to measure the frequency, then what we could do again, two options available to us here. First one is we could put a marker in the tank and then just count the waves that pass at each second. Or secondly, we could put a little bit of paper just so it touches the top of the bar as it vibrates and then just count the vibration. So count the number of times it hits that bit of paper. So two options there for working out the frequency, two options for working out the wavelength. Obviously, you do need to think about which one's going to be better in any given scenario. So just think about what they're asking you to do there and then you can pick which one works best. The next thing we need to consider is good old sound waves. Now, what we can do here is we can use sound in a couple of different ways. So the first way is we can actually use echoes to work out, obviously, how long it's going to take that echo to reach us. So what we do is we stand a certain distance from a wall, you shout, make a sound of some description, and time how long it takes for the echo to reach you. Because we've got distance and we've got time, then we can work out the speed from that one. The other slightly more high-tech version is to use microphones. So you've got two microphones, which are a set distance apart, connected onto an oscilloscope. You make your sound, and then you can use your oscilloscope to work out the time it takes to reach each of those two microphones. And since we know the distance they are apart, again, we can work out our speed nice and easily. The first of our formulas for the exam tomorrow is the wave velocity formula. So this is, again, one you need to remember. So wave velocity is your frequency times the wavelength. Going back to the ripple tank, if obviously they're asking you for how you could improve this, then yes, we can use other technology in terms of photographing it, filming it, playback in slow motion. Anything like that will also work nicely. So wave velocity, frequency times wavelength. And what we actually find is that the velocity of our sound is going to vary with two factors, temperature and pressure. Now, in terms of that formula, if you're on the foundation paper, they sometimes give you a reasonable number of them, but we don't know which ones they're not going to give you. So that one, because it is basically like a speed, this could be one that they don't give you. Okay, so frequency times wavelength. Just remember to make sure the wavelength is in meters. Higher tier, they're less likely to give you those formulas, so make sure that you do know them. Next bit is just for those of you doing GCSE physics. So a little bit about sound properties and the uses just for the GCSE physics folks. Hopefully we do know that when a wave travels from one medium to another, then the velocity and the direction could potentially change. And what we're seeing here is something called refraction. Now, if we've got our wave moving from a less dense medium to a more dense medium, so from air into glass or plastic, for example, then the wave is gonna slow down and bend towards the normal. So what we're going to see is that the wavelength is going to decrease, but the frequency will stay the same. 
If, however, that wave hits the boundary at zero degrees to the normal, so it literally kind of comes straight down at it, then we don't see the direction changing. If it hits literally straight down, then the speed is going to change, so it's going to move slower through the denser medium, but it's not going to change the direction at all there. When we have these waves hitting a boundary, then what we'll find is three things could happen. First one is we could have reflection, things like an echo. Second, we could have transmission. So this is where we could have possible refraction occurring. And the third one is it could be absorbed. What we also need to know about is a special type of sound, which is ultrasound. Now, definition of ultrasound, quite simply, is a sound with a frequency of greater than 20,000 hertz. And ultrasound is one of those things that we as humans can't hear. So our ears can't pick up anything of that kind of frequency. You'll find that your ears can pick up a much greater range of frequencies than, say, my ears, because you're a lot younger than I am. And therefore, you've still got the ability to hear a greater range of frequencies than those who get older. And what we're going to do is understand why a little bit later on for that one. In terms of why ultrasound is important to us, it's actually incredibly useful. Because it's got a short wavelength, we can actually focus that into a beam quite easily. For those of you doing the higher tier GCSE physics, you need to know how we can actually use that ultrasound now. So what we find is that the most common way, the way you've probably heard about ultrasound being used is in terms of scanning unborn babies. So what happens is when someone's pregnant, then they'll go have the ultrasound scan and then get that really quite interesting image of the baby that people go, look, there it is. And you'll just look and go, oh, yeah, we can all see that. Can't really, but just go with it. Two other ways that we can use ultrasound in the body other than scanning is monitoring blood flow and also finding and breaking up kidney stones. So in a question, if they were to ask you about other than scanning unborn babies, give a use of ultrasound, then you could talk about monitoring blood flow or breaking kidney stones. Those work fine. Now, the way that we actually use the ultrasound in order to scan the unborn baby is that we start off with our little transmitter. So here's our transmitter. And what that does is it actually sends the ultrasound into the body. So it's going to pass through the mother. And then as it hits the baby here, so it's hitting the different surfaces, it gets reflected back. And then it's picked up by the detector here, which goes off to a computer and then generates a nice little picture of a baby if you go with a 3D one. If you go with just a standard ultrasound, you get that gray smudgy picture instead. Now, the way that it can do that is because obviously the waves hit the boundary and then bounce back, then it times how long that takes. And therefore, it can calculate the distance because it knows the speed of the ultrasound. From that, it generates the picture on the computer screen of that little baby. Still, just for the higher tier physics folks, you need to know that we can also use echo sounding and sonar, which both use ultrasound in order to calculate the depth of water. So if we're thinking about submarines, fishermen, ships and things like this that are investigating the actual depths in the oceans, then that's using ultrasound. So they send it down into the water and they wait for it to bounce back up. Timing how long that takes gives you the distance. So this is the kind of stuff that they were doing when they were searching for that uh, plane that went missing. Then they use those little probes. They use the ultrasound to actually get the images of the sea floor and know where things are from that. Still for the higher tier physics folks, then we need to know what happens with sound. So hopefully you know that if you shout in a completely empty room, then initially there's an echo, but it doesn't echo endlessly. You're not going to be sitting in a room with that sound echoing around for the rest of time. It will fade away as time goes on. Now, the reason that we get that initial echo is that as it hits that wall, it then gets reflected. So we get the echo. But what happens is over time, that sound is actually going to be absorbed by the particles in the wall. So what we find is that the particles that make up the wall will absorb that sound. They vibrate that teeny tiny little bit and the wall becomes a tiny bit hotter. Obviously, walls are quite big and your voice doesn't actually carry that much energy. So it's not going to burst into flame or anything from the heat, but it will get a teeny bit hotter as you've transferred the energy there. Still for higher tier physics only, you need to know about the ear. 
So what we actually have obviously stuck on the side of your head are in theory two ears that are there just to detect, amplify and convert those sounds that we hear around us into an electrical signal that then goes to your brain and tells you what on earth you're listening to. So what we've actually got then is a diagram that hopefully you are quite familiar with. So this bit sticking on the outside of our head is the thing called the pinner. And the whole idea behind that is to actually gather the sound and get it so it goes into this little region here called the auditory canal. At the end of the auditory canal, you can see we've got this little bit here, which is the eardrum. So that's just a membrane that as the sound hits it, makes it vibrate slightly. Now, as that eardrum vibrates, you can see it's resting on these little bones, okay? The three little bones called the ossicles. So you've got the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So as the eardrum vibrates, it makes the little tiny bones vibrate, and they pass that along the little chain there. And what happens is they're going to continue passing it along until we get to this little structure here called the oval window. Now, that's another membrane. So we've literally gone in through the actual opening here, okay? So your auditory canal hits the eardrum, eardrum vibrates, the ossicles or the tiny bones, they vibrate in turn, they make the oval window vibrate, and we've passed that sound wave along to that point. Once we've actually got that far, we come into this bit that looks kind of like a snail shell, which is called the cochlea, and that's filled with a fluid. Now, the fluid in the cochlea, again, is going to transmit those vibrations from the oval window to these tiny little hairs that are actually on the wall of the cochlea itself. So as the sound is passing through, it makes those teeny tiny little hairs vibrate. And as that occurs, they release a chemical substance, which then triggers the nerve impulse that goes down the auditory nerve straight to the brain. Your brain processes that signal and tells you what the sound actually is. What we find then in terms of hearing is that you've got something called the natural frequency. Now, the frequency at which the object oscillates if it's displaced is the natural frequency. And what we actually find is that those teeny tiny little hairs inside your ear in that cochlea, they've got different lengths and therefore they're going to resonate at different frequencies. So what we find is depending on what the range of the lengths of the hairs inside your cochlea actually are, that's going to tell you what range of sounds you can hear. So what we find is as you get older, then the shortest hairs get lost. And that means you can't hear the highest frequency sounds, which is why things like the uh, shopping centers or town centers where they have issues with large groups of teenagers hanging around, then some of them will employ something called the mosquito sound, because that is just this high frequency sound. They play through loudspeakers in that area. You guys hear it and get really irritated by this high pitched ringing in your ears and therefore disperse and go elsewhere, whereas anyone who is older will not hear a thing and be able to sit there for hours on end and not realise that that sound is even playing. So it's one of those little things that council sometimes do just to get rid of you guys and leave the other general people of the older population free to roam without any concern. Back for combined physics, higher and foundation folks now, we're coming on to electromagnetic waves next. Now, hopefully, one of the things we already know is the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is something that you hopefully know in the correct sequence, because they do like to give you parts of this missing and get you to fill in the blanks. So you not only need to know the names of them, but the correct order for them as well. So radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. So what we actually find then is if we think about the radio wave, first of all, then those have the longest wavelength, but the shortest frequency or lowest frequency. And then by the time you're all the way at the end with the gamma rays, then those will have the shortest wavelength, but the highest frequency. So if you remember those and you know the order in which they go in, you can then get the good idea about whether they're high frequency, low frequency, long wavelength, short wavelength. Now, what we actually find then is that in terms of the electromagnetic waves, they're made up of these oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And those fields are going to oscillate at 90 degrees to the direction of the wave. So if your wave's going that way, then what we actually find is that you've got the electric fields at 90 degrees that way, 
and then your magnetic fields are 90 degrees this way. So we've got this oscillation of both electric and magnetic fields, hence electromagnetic wave. Okay, electro for the electric, magnetic for the magnetic part. When we're looking at all of those electromagnetic waves then, one thing we should remember is that they all travel at the same speed through a vacuum. So the speed you should remember is 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So whether it's visible light, x-rays, radio waves, always 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second as the actual speed there. Now, what we find is that when we're looking at these electromagnetic waves, if something is giving them out, they're referred to as a source. And then we will also find that objects are capable of absorbing electromagnetic waves. So, for example, your skin is going to absorb infrared and that warms it up a little bit. And those electromagnetic waves are quite important to us because we can actually transfer energy from sources to absorbers and therefore it makes it useful to us. If you're doing the higher tier, whether it be combined or GCSE physics, you need to know about how we can actually generate and detect radio waves. So what we actually end up with here is we're going to generate this oscillating potential difference across a wire. OK, so this is in our transmitting part. As a result of that oscillating potential difference, then we're going to have the little electrons in the metal that makes up the wire moving backwards and forwards. Now, because of that, we get this changing electric and magnetic field being generated, which is an electromagnetic wave, a radio wave. So that radio wave is then transmitted and it's going to travel through the air. When it then comes into contact with a piece of metal, so your actual antenna, then it's going to do the same thing to the electrons there. It's going to make the electrons within the metal actually move. And as a result of that, we generate an electric signal, which is what we can then convert into the sounds we hear through the radio. Back to everyone. So combined physics, higher and foundation folks again. We need to know about the uses and dangers of electromagnetic radiation. So a few key uses to remember, first of all. If we're thinking about microwaves, then that's what we use in mobile phones, first of all. Also in things like satellites, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of that is microwave based. We use radio waves in terms of radio, as the name suggests, and also TV. Infrared is what we we'll use with remote controls and also things like optic fibers. And visible light is one of those things that we can use for communication, particularly across ships and things like this. Now, one of the things that they used to like is talking about the difference between microwaves and infrared as a method of cooking food. So what we find is if we think about microwaves, first of all, then that's obviously in a microwave oven. That's the name suggesting it's not a trick. So microwave ovens emit microwaves and that microwave is then absorbed by fat and water that makes up the food. Now, the big advantage about those is the microwaves are actually capable of penetrating through a few centimetres into the food itself all the way around. So the first few centimetres actually can absorb those microwaves with the fat and the water. Then in order to cook the rest of the food, that energy is transferred by conduction to the middle. If we consider the infrared then, which is used in your conventional oven, then that is literally absorbed by the particles on the very, very outside surface only. So it doesn't get any deeper, just the outermost surface particles. Then we've got to have conduction past that energy right the way through to the centre of the food to cook the rest of it. Hence why microwaves are much quicker at cooking the food than the conventional ovens. If we then think about some of the other ways that we can use this, if we're thinking about things like DVDs, CDs and so on, then that's using a laser. So that's visible light in order to read the little pits on the disc there. If we're thinking about natural ways that we will use these electromagnetic waves, then ultraviolet, very important to us, because in your body, then the ultraviolet radiation that you absorb through your skin is actually going to let your body make vitamin D. And vitamin D is vital for you to have strong bones and avoid getting a condition called rickets, which is basically where your bones bow and your legs bow. We could also use ultraviolet in forensics. So we can obviously show up different bodily fluids using it. And we can also identify forged banknotes. So if ever you've seen them in the shop, hold a note under a little light. That's an ultraviolet light. 
We can use ultraviolet to sterilize water as well because it will kill any bacteria present. If we come on to x-rays next, then hopefully you do know one of the most common uses of x-rays is obviously to image bones and see whether you've broken something or not. We can also use x-rays in order to kill cancer cells. And the last one on there is the gamma rays, which can kill bacteria and kill cancer cells. If we now think about the dangers, then you're going to see that there's a little bit of an oddity here because some of the things we said are benefits are also going to come into drawbacks. So if we think about ultraviolet, first of all, then if you've got too much ultraviolet being absorbed by your skin, then it can actually damage the DNA in the skin cells and lead to skin cancer. Now, another problem is obviously with your eyes. If you absorb too much ultraviolet light in your eyes, then you can actually develop cataracts. So the ways that we can avoid that is obviously using proper sun protection factor with our sun creams when we're going outside. That then means that you can be outside for a lot longer. So if it's got factor 20, then it's 20 times as long as you could normally be outside before you burn. And obviously to protect your eyes, you should be wearing proper sunglasses, the ones that actually provide UV protection. So when you're buying sunglasses, you should check, they've got a little label on there that says they protect against UVA, UVB. If not, and they're just those cheap ones that don't protect against anything, there's not really any point wearing them to be honest. Next one are the X-rays. So these ones can actually damage cells and cause cancer. Bit strange because we said we can use X-rays to treat cancer. So this is why when you actually go and have x-rays, they do ask you when you've had the last x-ray and they try to reduce the amount you have there. The person that will take the x-rays in hospital is someone called a radiographer. And they obviously have to take steps in order to minimize the amount of x-rays they're exposed to on any given day. Otherwise, they'd all develop cancer quite young and that's not a great job prospect. So what you'll notice is the radiographer then will stand behind a lead screen or sometimes completely leave the room before they actually take the x-ray of you. They'll also have a little badge that they wear on their uniform that actually changes when the safe exposure limit has been reached. So that just says you're done for the day in there. And then we've got our gamma rays, which, as we've said, we use to treat cancer because it kills those cancer cells, but they can also damage and kill other cells in the body as well. For those of you doing GCSE physics higher tier, you need to know about how we can use electromagnetic waves to carry out imaging within the body. So one of the things we can do is produce something called a thermogram. Now a thermogram is made using a thermal imaging camera. So what we've got inside our thermal imaging camera then is something called a charged coupled device or a CCD. And the pixels inside that CCD will absorb the infrared radiation. And as a result of that, they produce the image. What we tend to do is then add colors to it by using a computer, and then we can have that nice, easy sort of reference point, if you like. So we'll have the red as the hot areas and the blue as the cold areas. And the hotter areas will emit more infrared radiation, hence why we will see this difference between the ones that are emitting a lot of infrared versus the ones that are emitting much less infrared. If we think about x-rays and the way that they actually work and allow us to see a bone, even though it's obviously stuck in the middle of a load of flesh, then the bones will absorb x-rays, but soft tissue, so all of this stuff, all your muscles and skin, that doesn't. So that will allow the x-rays to pass straight through the soft tissue. It's absorbed then by the bones so that when it's then passing through your body to this photographic plate that they've put underneath, then it's obviously going to be absorbing x-rays and darkening, but not in the area where it was absorbed by a bone. So we get that white bit where the bone was. We can also use that charge coupled device CCD to detect x-rays and the colors that we apply then show the different densities of materials. So the higher the density, the more x-rays are absorbed. Now, one of the things that we can use here to see inside the body that's a little bit more useful in some cases than an x-ray is the computerized tomography or CT scanner. So we can then have a little look inside the body and see what's actually going on without the need to slice and dice, which is always good. In terms of the gamma rays then, we can also use these to give us an idea of what's happening inside the body without, again, cutting people open. 
And wherever possible, we want to avoid cutting people open to see what's happening, because any time we cut the body, we increase the chance of infections. So we can use gamma rays as something called a tracer in medicine. So this tracer is something that you would either inject, swallow or inhale, depending on where in the body we're actually trying to investigate. And then we use a little scanner to detect where the gamma rays are being emitted. From that, it will connect onto a computer and give us a nice little image so we can see what's what. So that if we actually have something like a blockage in a particular blood vessel, then we're going to see an accumulation of the gamma rays on one side of the blockage and nothing on the other because they're not able to actually get through. So just remember to actually apply it to the right scenario. So they could ask you how you could identify where a blockage was. Just talk about the fact that we would have it injected, swallowed, inhaled, whatever it was. And then we'd be looking with the detector to find an area where it increases. And then there's a drop off after that because that shows you the location of that block. Same kind of application that we can find in terms of underground pipes with our gamma rays there as well, because we can then just pass the detector along the surface and pick out where the problem is without having to dig up every single road along that entire pipeline. Now, next thing for those of you doing GCSE physics, both foundation and higher, you need to know about how to draw ray diagrams, which hopefully is a recap on stuff you did all the way back in key stage three. So what we actually have then are ray diagrams are what we're going to use to show reflection and refraction. So a few key points for you when you're drawing a ray diagram. First of all, use a ruler. Do not draw this freehand. Make sure you actually take a ruler into your exam tomorrow. Secondly, use a pencil. If you make a mistake, you can rub it out. If you've done this in pen and you've only got the one little space with the diagram, you've got nowhere to go with that. So pencil and ruler, first two things. You're then going to draw the lines to represent the rays, obviously using your pencil and your ruler. You draw your normal at 90 degrees to the surface that the ray is hitting. And then you're going to measure your angles between the normal and the rays and add the arrows to show the direction. So what we'd end up with is this one here for your reflection. And hopefully we remember that the angle of incidence is the same as the angle of reflection. So as the ray comes in, it hits our surface here. And then this angle between the normal and the angle of the beam coming in is going to be identical to this angle here. And then we've also got refraction, which is obviously through a block of some form. So it's moving from one medium into one of a different density. So what we see is we've got our angle of incidence between the normal and our incoming ray. And then it's going to bend either towards or away from the normal, depending on which density it's going, either more or less. And then obviously it passes out the other side and would do a similar thing. So just bear in mind that the ray diagrams, you do need to use a pencil and a ruler. Don't just freehand it and rush it because you will lose the marks quite easily. For those of you doing higher tier GCSE physics, you need to know a little bit more about refraction. Now, hopefully we do know that those waves are going to be refracted when they change speed. So as that light is entering the denser medium at the angle, it slows down and bends towards the normal. And the greater the difference in the density between those two mediums, then the greater the change in direction will be. In terms of where this can actually be useful to us, then we can actually use this to transmit information across large distances. Because Earth itself is a curve, so it's obviously a big curve, it's a planet, but it is curved, then we can't transmit waves across very large distances easily without applying this. Because what we find is that if you try and send a wave, it travels in a straight line, remember. So what we need to do is then apply this idea of reflection in order to then bounce those waves off different layers of the atmosphere or off satellites. So if we want to send a radio wave a long distance, then we actually bounce them. So we reflect them off the ionosphere. If we want to send high frequency radio waves or microwaves, then they're able to penetrate further through the atmosphere to the satellites. And then we can reflect them back down to a different region of planet Earth. Still for the GCSE physics higher tier folks, you need to know about how this is going to be determined. And quite simply, it's all about wavelength. So the wavelength is going to determine what actually happens to our electromagnetic waves. So what we'll find is something like a wall, for example, then that's able to transmit radio waves and microwaves. But something like visible light and ultraviolet 
get absorbed by it. So the different wavelength there is determining what's happening. So that's why you can hear a radio inside your house because the radio waves can pass through the wall, but you can't see through the wall because the visible light's being absorbed by it. If we think about the atmosphere as the other key area that we should concern ourselves with, then X-rays and gamma rays are actually absorbed by the atmosphere. Quite useful because without that atmosphere absorbing the X-rays and the gamma rays, life wouldn't exist down here on Earth at all. Now, hi, uh, sorry, the GCSE Physics Higher and Foundation folks, we need to know about lenses. So hopefully we do remember we've got two types of lens. You've got convex and you've got concave lenses. We look at the convex lens first of all. So convex is going to be known as a converging lens in some cases. And what we find here is these are the lenses that refract the rays to a principal focus or a focal point. And they're the ones that we're using in magnifiers. So this is the little diagram that you are hopefully familiar with to do with our convex lens. So what we can see, we've got our lens here. You've got your principal axis, which is the one that runs straight through the center. And then we've got our different rays of light coming in in the red. And you can see that they're bending to that principal focus. Now, what we actually find is that one thing we should know is something called the focal length, which is the distance from the optical center to that principal focus. So you can see on here, we've got the optical center right smack bang in the middle, and then we've got a principal focus. So that distance there is our focal length. If we look at the concave lens next, then this one looks a little bit different. So there is our concave lens. So you can see it bends in, it looks kind of like a cave, hence concave. And these ones may also be referred to as diverging lenses. And what they do is they spread the light out. So what we actually find here is when you look at your little diagram, again, we've got our principal axis running through the center. We've got our different rays of light coming in here. And you can see it's actually bending the light outwards. So rather than bending it in, as we saw with our convex, so it's all coming to that central point there. Instead, this one is actually bending the light outwards. So what we find on this one for the focal length is that it's the distance from the virtual focus to the optical center. So what we can see, we've got our virtual focus here, which if you look and you extend those lines all back in a straight line, then what you find is they all meet at this one point, which is our virtual focus. So from there to the optical center is your focal length. Now, obviously, these lenses are useful to us in terms of correcting problems with vision. So you may be either short sighted or long sighted. Now, short sight is where the distant objects appear blurry, but things up close are absolutely fine. And what we actually find in this scenario is that the rays of light are focusing in front of the retina. So they're focusing too far forward in your eye. So what we use in that scenario is a concave lens because it's gonna spread those rays of light out and therefore they're going to focus on the back of your retina perfectly. If you're long sighted, that means that near objects are blurry and distant objects are nice and clear and the rays are actually trying to focus basically too far back, so behind the retina. So we use a convex lens, which then refracts the rays so they focus directly on the retina again. So short sight is concave, long sight is convex. If they're Ming and they ask you to draw a ray diagram with our lenses, then there are basically three key stages to remember here. So first one is you draw the ray from the top of the object to the lens parallel to that bit called the principal axis. Secondly, you draw the ray from the lens through the focal point. And then finally, thirdly, you draw the ray from the top of the object through the center to the lens. Now, if you wanna see how to do that more, I'd suggest you head on over to the lenses video just so that you can take it a little bit slower and go through that one. Last little bit in terms of our lenses is about where we'd actually use them. So we need to know about convex and concave lenses, where we use them, the types of images that they actually generate. So first thing that we've got then, the convex lenses, we would use them typically, as we said, in a magnifying glass. And the type of image that we get with our magnifying glass is a virtual image that's magnified and upright, so the right way up. If it's a camera, then it's going to be a real image 
that's diminished and inverted, and the projector is a real image that's magnified and inverted. Second type of lens are concave. This is what we'd be using in things like the little spy holes in hotel doors or your front door and the rear windows on coaches. Then they both generate the same type of image. So virtual, diminished and upright. For those of you doing GCSE physics higher tier, you need to know about light and color next. So hopefully we do know that when we're talking about light and we're talking about white light, then that's actually made up of an entire spectrum of colors. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So if you pass white light through a prism, then it actually is split up into those different colors and you get the rainbow on the other side. So that's that process called dispersion. So we split it up into the individual wavelength so you can actually see each one in turn. Now, the reason it does that is because as we've got each frequency of light traveling at different speeds through the glass, then it's going to be refracted by a different amount. So the higher the frequency, the more refraction occurs, and therefore they all separate out to give you the rainbow on the other side there. If we then apply this to why we can actually see things as different color and we don't just live in a black and white world, then inside your eye, you've actually got these different types of cells. So what we have are these cells called cone cells, and they are sensitive to different frequencies. So red, green, and blue frequencies of light. And what actually happens is based on which of those cone cells detects the different colors and in what quantities is then going to be interpreted by the information sent to your brain so that you then get this perceived color that we're then picking up. So it's all based on those receptor cells detecting the different frequencies and sending that information to your brain to then allow us to work out what color it is we're actually looking at. Still just for the physics higher tier folks, then we need to know about filters. Now, hopefully this is quite a logical way to go because if we have obviously our white light passing through a filter, the other side, it's one color of light that you see. Now that hopefully tells you that as we get the white light coming in with all of those different frequencies, then the filter is going to absorb all frequencies except for the one that matches it. So if we have a red filter and we've got all those different frequencies coming in, the only one passing out the other side will be the red light. If it was a blue filter, then we'd see the same thing. Everything comes in, gets absorbed, except for blue, which is transmitted. So what we find is if you were to put two different colored filters, so a red and then a blue, then what we'd have is it appears black because all of the light would be absorbed. Now, back for everyone. So this is combined physics, higher foundation, the whole lot, as we move on to the next topic, which is all about radioactivity. This is going to be going over some of the bits you did in your chemistry as well, because we've got a bit of overlap here. So what we've got then is inside the nucleus of an atom, then we've got two subatomic particles, the protons and the neutrons. They could ask you that little table that you are hopefully very familiar with in terms of the relative mass and the relative charge of the three subatomic particles. So the proton has a relative mass of one and a relative charge of plus one. The neutron relative mass of one and a relative charge of zero. And the electron has a relative mass of 0.0005 and the relative charge of minus one. So make sure you do know those because they can ask it on the physics paper as well as obviously what they could have asked on the chemistry. Now, what we find is that the nucleus, as we've said, is made up of the protons and the neutrons. Neutrons have no charge, protons positive charge. So the charge on the nucleus itself is dependent on the number of protons present and the nucleus will always have a positive charge. If they ask you what an isotope is, then that's an atom with the same atomic number, but a different mass number. And the reason for that is that it's got the same number of protons and electrons, but it's got a different number of neutrons there. So what we find is that you could have a range of different isotopes of one particular element. So we've got carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, three different isotopes of carbon there. They've all got six protons and six electrons, but they've got a different number of neutrons. So carbon 12 has got six neutrons, carbon 13 has seven, and carbon 14 has eight. And we just worked out the same way that we do in chemistry to work them. So obviously your protons and electrons are quite simply just your proton number 
And then if you do the mass minus your pro proton number, then you've got your number of neutrons. So it's dead easy to work out. In terms of the stability of our atoms, then not every atom is stable. Some atoms are, and then they will not decay. So if you have a stable atom, they do not undergo decay. But if we've got an atom that has an unstable nucleus, then they undergo this process of decay and they emit radiation as they do so. So what we actually find then is that we've got these radioactive materials, which are the ones with an un unstable nucleus, and therefore they're going to emit radiation. Four types of radiation you need to know about. So alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron. So what we actually find then is alpha is a particle, first of all, and it's pretty much the nucleus of a helium atom. So make sure that you do remember that when we're looking at this and we're looking for its actual equation symbol, then HE for helium, it's got a mass of four and two is the atomic number. If we're thinking about our beta, then this is again a particle which is actually a fast moving electron. So when we're looking at the symbol for our beta particle, we've got the E for our electron, zero and minus one. If we're talking about gamma, then that's an electromagnetic wave, as we know from the electromagnetic spectrum. So because of that, it doesn't have an equation symbol. It's purely energy. And the last one, the neutron, hopefully we do know that is a particle because it's part of the nucleus. And what we find for that one in terms of its symbol is it's a lowercase n, 1, and 0. So we need to know the equation symbols for those three because when we come on to have a look at the actual symbols being used in the equations for the radioactive decay, you've got to be able to apply them. Now, what we find is that those neutrons can actually decay to make a proton and an electron. So remember that fact because it's going to be useful in a moment. The most common way that they show you this is with this lovely little diagram here. So what we've got alpha, beta and gamma. And what we're then seeing is how they penetrate through different materials. So we're starting off here with just a few sheets of paper, basically. And alpha particles get stopped by that tiny amount of paper. The beta particles, however, will pass through the few sheets of paper and they get stopped by a few mils of aluminium and the gamma go through the paper, through the aluminium, and they will only be mostly stopped by the few centimetres of lead or a few metres of concrete. So what we can see here are that these three different types of radiation have different penetrating powers. So the alpha is the least penetrating, gamma the most penetrating. You really need to know those bits of information because what they can do is actually give you something like a six mark question asking you then to work out what kind of radiation A, B and C consists of. So they're going to give you readings from a device called a Geiger Muller tube or a Geiger counter, which is used to measure the amount of radiation. And it's going to tell you how much is actually detected after paper, after aluminium, after some lead, and then ask you to work out what radiation each one is. The one thing to watch out for on this, if they're being a little bit trickier, is sometimes it's not just one type of radiation present. Sometimes it will be a combination of both alpha and beta, for example. So what you'd notice there is that you'd start off with your initial count. It would decrease slightly after the paper, showing you that you had alpha, and then it would drop off massively and down to pretty much zero after you went through the few millimeters of your aluminium showing you you had the beta. So take it a little bit of time, work out where alpha is, where beta is, where gamma is, and then look for any of those that you're thinking, actually that doesn't fit perfectly with just one and think, does that mean that there's two of them involved in that? So just look out for that one and just explain each one in turn and you should be able to get maximum marks on that. Now, in terms of when we're looking at this, it's not just the, ion, the actual ranges, it's also their ionizing powers we need to know about. So again, we're looking at alpha, beta and gamma here. So our alpha particles are quite large in terms of their relative mass. So what we find is they've got quite a high ionizing power, but a really short range. Whereas by the time we get down to the gamma, 
then they've got no mass because obviously they're electromagnetic waves, but their ionizing power is really low. However, their range is long. Now, what we see is we get that pattern between the ionizing power and the range, because what we find is to ionize an atom, we've got to transfer energy to it. So what happens is our alpha particles transfer lots of energy to the material. So they've got a high ionizing power, but if they've transferred their energy to the atoms, then they don't have that energy to then keep traveling. So their range is short and vice versa for our gamma rays there. In terms of our nuclear equations, then this is what we need to be able to do in terms of working them out. So if memory serves, then last year, I think they gave you all three to work out. So it's worth a few marks if this does come up. Now, the good news is it's pretty much a counting exercise. So what we'd start off with is a little equation where they'd have missed out something. So let's just put in those ones first of all. So what they give you is an equation something like this. So we've got our initial atom over here, and then we've got what we're making plus our alpha particle. And there are two gaps. So what they're asking you to do is work out the gaps. And as I said, we're counting. If we've got 240 here, and then on this side, we've got 236, that just has to make it add up to 240. So it's a four. And the same at the bottom. If we start off with 94 and two are here, then all you've got to do is put your 92 in there. So this one is pretty much count up and then subtract what they've given you on the other side to work out the missing numbers. If they're being super mean, I suppose they could just leave your actual alpha particle off in its entirety and expect you to know that it is the helium with the four and the two. But if you've learned those, that's no problem there. So when we look at alpha decay, then what we're finding is that we're emitting an alpha particle, which is our helium nucleus made up of two protons and two neutrons. Because it's made up of two protons and two neutrons, then it's got a mass of four, because obviously we know each proton, and each neutron has a mass of one. And what we then see is that we've only got the two protons, hence atomic number is two. And as I say, whatever they give you at the start, just take off the four and the two, and then you've got the other one. For beta decay, then, what we're finding here is we've got a neutron that's going to decay into our proton and an electron. Remember, I said that was important earlier on. So what we actually find in our beta decay is that we're going to start off with something like carbon. And then what we're going to form is, oh, sorry, it's terrible minus one. That is a minus one, not a weird little R shape. So we start off with our carbon here. So we've got our mass of 14, atomic number is six. And then because we're obviously undergoing this beta decay, so a neutron is decaying to form a proton and an electron, then what we find is proton number, this goes up by one. Because if we're changing a neutron into a proton and an electron, then if we start off with six protons, we get seven. Stays the same with the 14. And we obviously have our fast moving electron being given off over here. Because obviously the atomic number has changed, then your symbol has changed. And again, that's something that they're not likely to ask you to work out. Just for the simple fact, you don't get a periodic table in this one. So they're going to give you that symbol. But just remember that it does change the element. Last one, the gamma then. This one is where we've got no mass or charge because they're electromagnetic waves. So we see no change to the mass or the atomic number. If we were talking about the neutron decay, then decay of some nuclei leads to the production of large numbers of these neutrons. So to make it stable, those neutrons then have to be emitted. So just bear in mind that the neutron decay then, if we've got this increased number of neutrons, and again, I'll give you a very quick little example here. So uh, let's use helium in this case. Then what we'd actually find is we need to emit the excess neutrons to make it stable once more. So we've got too many neutrons and therefore we need to emit them in order to get it to its stable form here. So that should be quite easy, just a counting exercise and making sure you've got the right numbers in the right places. The next thing we need to know is half-life. Hopefully we do know that when we're talking about radiation, then this is emitted at random. It's not following any fixed pattern. It's not a case of, right, you go first, then you, then you. It's a random process. 
And we use our Geiger counter to then measure the actual radiation being given off the activity. So that's actually measured in units called Becquerels, which are given the symbol of capital B, lowercase q. And what we then find is that's working out how much radiation is given off per second by this radioactive material. If we're talking about the half-life, then that's the time it takes for that activity to reduce by half, hence half-life. So what we're actually going to be saying here really is it's how long it takes for half of the unstable nuclei to undergo the process of decay. If you're doing foundation, that's all you need to know is the definition. If you're doing higher tier, then what you actually need to know then is how to calculate the half-life. So what we find here is you've got two options. We can either do it from a graph or we can do it as a calculation. So if you were to be given a question along the lines of a sample of radon-222 has an activity of 100 becquerels, calculate the activity after 11.4 days, half-life of radon-222 is 3.8 days, then we'd be doing it by calculation because you don't have a graph. So first thing is you calculate the number of half-lives. So they've told you how many days it's going for, 11.4, and they've told you the half-life is 3.8. So all you need to do there is 11.4 divided by 3.8, which tells us that we've actually got three half-lives. If you do that and you can't remember anything else and you've shown you're working, then you should be getting one mark anyway. So always do that bit first of all. However many days it's going for, maybe it's months, maybe it's years, whatever, the time it goes for divided by the half-life tells you how many half-lives it's going to experience. Then to calculate your new activity, all you've got to do is obviously reduce it by half that many times. Now, obviously you could do this by simply sitting there and going, well, if it's three half lives, then obviously three halves is an eighth. Or you could literally sit there and you don't feel that confident with fractions, type in your original activity of 100, divide it by two, divide that by two, and divide that by two a third time, and it gives you the answer. Whichever way you are more confident, feel free to do that and then just write down your answer at the end. Your other one is using the graph of half-life to actually calculate your activity. And what we're going to do here then is you would have your little graph first of all, and it will always have this lovely little curvy shape. So wherever it is at the very top, so if at the top we had our initial activity of 100, then what we'd do if you needed to know how long one half-life was, 100 divided by 2 would be 50. And then from that point, you come along to the actual curve and then use your ruler to come down to the bottom. Whatever time that is, that's your half-life. So it's quite an easy thing to be able to work out half-life from a graph there. Back for everyone, so higher foundation physics and combined folks, we need to know a little bit about these different electrons and how they're arranged within our atoms. Hopefully we do know from chemistry that when we're talking about the atom structure, then we've got electrons that occupy these different orbitals or energy levels. So around the nucleus, you've got these different energy levels and the electrons sit within them. Now, depending on which atom we're talking about is gonna determine what energy levels they've got because different atoms have different energy levels and the electrons that we find within them will usually occupy the lowest possible energy level, so the one closest to the nucleus there. Now, what we're going to look at here is what actually happens when they absorb this energy. So we're going to look at something called the photon model. So in the photon model, then, electromagnet electromagnetic radiation is emitted and absorbed as packets of energy called photons, hence the name. And the energy of each photon is proportional to the frequency. So what we actually find then is that for an electron to become excited, then it needs to actually absorb a photon of the right energy. So what we're going to find is for that electron to move to the higher energy level, it's got to absorb a photon of the right amount of energy to do that. Once it's absorbed that photon, then the electron moves to the higher energy level and it's in what's called the excited state. So we've taken it from where it's normally found, given it extra energy, made it excited, and therefore put it in an energy level higher than it should be. 
It's not going to stay there, though. It will actually fall back. And as it does so, it's going to then give off that radiation. If we pass through uh, light of, I'll try again. If we pass light of all frequencies through something like hydrogen gas, but it works with any gas, then some frequencies get absorbed as a result of this absorbing and therefore moving the electrons up. If we then have a little look and see what spectrum we get after it's passed through that gas, we'd have these dark black bands at certain frequencies. Now, that's because those frequencies have been absorbed by the atom as those electrons have been excited and moved to their higher energy levels. So what we find is each individual element will have a specific pattern of those bands. So by looking at that, we can then identify what gas we've got. And this is how we've actually studied stars and worked out what they're made from. If we've got a photon that's got enough energy, it can actually completely remove that electron from the atom and therefore ionize it. So when we're ionizing something, we're removing electrons from it, remember. So in terms of the ones that have enough energy to do that, we're looking at photons of UV, X-ray and gamma ray frequencies. Once those electrons are in their excited state, as we said, they're going to drop back down. And as they move from the higher to the lower energy level, they then emit radiation. So what we can then have is an emission spectrum, which is going to show the set of frequencies of radiation being emitted by the atom as those excited electrons drop back to the lower energy level. Now, again, you'll have a very specific pattern of those bands being given out so you can identify what it is from that. The actual frequency of the radiation that's being emitted is going to depend on the difference in the energy of the energy levels it's moving between. And the key thing to remember here is it's not always a case of it's going to go from one energy level straight down to the bottom one. Sometimes it will do that in more than one step. So it will take a couple of little stages, releasing lower energy each time. So it could either do it as one big step and release, obviously, a large amount of energy at that one point, or it could drop in a few smaller steps, releasing less energy at each stage. The greatest energy difference that we could ever have then quite simply, is when we're going to move the electron from an energy level just below the ionization energy. So at that point, obviously, it's the furthest it could possibly drop. And that's going to vary in different atoms, because obviously, it depends how far up we can put it as to how much energy it can then emit. So something like hydrogen, for example, can emit UV photons, but something like carbon can actually get to the X-ray photons. So different energy depending on the different atoms there. Next thing we need to know about is background radiation. So background radiation, quite simply, is made up of all the sources of radiation that you're exposed to day in, day out, all the time in your everyday life. So the vast majority of this, 50% of it, comes from this stuff called radon gas, which is emitted by rocks. Your next up is going to be these artificial sources, so medical uses and bits like that. Then we come down to the grounds and buildings, food and drink, cosmic rays, and other random things. Now, there are two terms that you really need to know here, and they have asked about these different terms before in terms of definitions, contamination and irradiation. So contamination, first of all, occurs when radioactive material is taken inside the body or on the skin. So when it's internal contamination, we can't remove that. So that's the great case of that Russian spy who was poisoned from his cup of tea, for example. Irradiation occurs when radioactive material is outside your body, and therefore the radiation can travel into your body. So contamination is inside your body, and irradiation is the material outside your body. The big issue and why we're so concerned about radiation and it coming into contact with us is that when radiation enters your body, it can actually damage the DNA inside your cells. And if it damages the DNA inside your cells, it can lead to cancer. So what we find is that if you've only got small doses of radiation leading to damage, then your body can actually repair those relatively easily in a lot of cases. So what you won't realize is that you've had many, many different mutations that have occurred in your body, but your body's repaired them quite happily. Obviously, if it's larger doses of radiation, your body won't be able to cope. That'll be overwhelmed and therefore it can't do anything. For those of you doing GCSE physics, both higher and foundation, you need to know a little bit more about the medical traces. 
So we've already said that it's a radioactive isotope that's either injected, inhaled or swallowed, and then we use a camera in order to detect it and then show up these problems in the body. The bit you need to know is that we've got to obviously select quite carefully what isotope to actually use for this purpose, because we've got to make sure that the half-life is just right. So we don't want it to have a half-life that's really short. Otherwise, by the time you've actually ingested, injected or inhaled it, then and they've got their little camera ready, it's already broken down. You're not picking it up. That's no use to us. And we don't want it to be too long because we don't want it obviously to be emitting radiation for the next 20 years from your body. Again, not good for you. So we've got to get the half-life that's neither too long nor too short. And it's got to be the right type of radiation. If we're putting it inside your body, you're not going to be selecting something that's going to emit alpha particles. Because as we said, they're stopped by a few sheets of paper. If you're inhaling it and trying to look at your lungs, you're not going to pick that up. All it's going to do is ionize the cells of your lungs and lead to probably cancer. So we need to pick the right type of radiation that's able to be actually emitted by the body. So you can pick it up on the detector and have the right length half-life. The next one we can use is the gamma knife, which is what we're going to do in order to actually treat cancers. So what this is, it's where we've got a source of gamma radiation and we're going to move it around the body, but keep it focused on the tumour. So the whole idea behind this is it gives the tumour cells that lethal dose and kills them, but we're not killing all the healthy cells around it. So by moving it, it means that any of the healthy cells that are also coming into contact with the gamma radiation are getting a lower dose and therefore shouldn't be killed. But the tumor cells are getting the high dose and will be killed. Still for GCSE physics folks only, we need to know about nuclear fission. Now, nuclear fission, so F-I-S-S-I-O-N, this is where we're getting a large nucleus and we're splitting it into smaller nuclei and neutrons. Now, what we're going to find here is that if the nucleus absorbs a neutron, then fission becomes more likely. So what we actually find is the nucleus is going to split to produce two smaller nuclei and two or three neutrons. So what we find is some good fissionable substances are uranium-235 and uranium-239. So that means that they split easily. So if we actually fire a neutron at our uranium-235, then what's going to happen is that's going to split into two smaller nuclei. And at the same time, three neutrons are going to be released. Now, those three neutrons can go off and then join with others. And what we can then find is we could get ourselves into a chain reaction situation. So if we split that one nucleus, release two or three neutrons, they can then trigger the fission reactions in two or three other nuclei. They each release two or three neutrons and so on. So this builds up quite quick. Now, what we find is that in a nuclear power station, we're using fission to actually heat water, producing steam, steam drives turbines, turbines turn the generators, generators make the electricity. We don't want a chain reaction occurring inside our nuclear power station. Otherwise, the amount of energy we generate is going to increase and increase and increase until bang. Now, we do not want that happening. That is something that would be very bad. So what we actually find then is we use these things called control rods that will absorb any extra neutrons. So when the reaction is getting a little bit too much, we lower the control rods in, they absorb the extra neutrons and bring that reaction back under control again. The key difference between our nuclear power station and a nuclear bomb is nuclear bombs don't have control rods. So when we start that reaction going, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, getting to this vast amount of energy being transferred in a very short space of time, hence the destructive nature of it. The next type of reaction we need to know for our GCSE physics folks only is nuclear fusion. So F-U-S-I-O-N. Now, nuclear fusion is where two lighter nuclei are joined together to make a more stable nuclei. So what we actually find there is two little ones are being joined to make one larger one. Good example of this is what's happening inside our sun. So our sun has a lot of hydrogen and the hydrogen nuclei are fusing together to form larger nuclei. And what's happening at the point that that's occurring is that energy is being transferred from a nuclear store 
by heating and the electromagnetic radiation. Now, what we find here is the reason that we're not using nuclear fusion here on Earth to generate all of this amazing heat and so forth is down to the fact that when we're thinking about trying to get protons to go together, they don't want to do that. They're both positively charged and hopefully remember, like charges, repel. So when the protons come close together, normally they just repel from one another. So to get nuclear fusion, we've got to overcome that repulsion. And we do that with the high temperatures and the pressures that we have inside the sun itself. So what we find is the high temperatures then increase the speed at which all those nuclei are moving around that, and the high pressures actually enable the nuclei to get close enough to undergo that fusion. What we do find, though, is that by this nuclear fusion reaction, the heaviest element we can get to is iron. If we want something heavier than iron, then we need a supernova to achieve that. So hopefully something not going to be happening too close to us here. What we then find then is if we think about the products of our fusion reaction, then the mass of those products is slightly less than the mass of the reactants we started with. And because of that, what we actually see is a huge amount of energy being transferred in the form of radiation. And we go back to that good old formula that everyone is probably familiar with, even if they know nothing about science, E equals delta mc squared. So E is our energy in joules, delta m is our change in mass, the C is our speed of light, which is obviously 300 million meters per second. So if you're squaring 300 million meters per second, and then timesing that even by the tiniest change in mass, we have a huge amount of energy. So next topic then is back for everyone. So combined physics, higher foundation, and we're going on to our energy topic. Now, this is the one where they could potentially pull back and ask you any formula that we've looked at in paper one as well, because what we're going to look at here are the different energy transfers and the energy stores. So hopefully we do know that energy is our quantity in joules that tells you something that's possible. And what we've got are a few different types of stores that we need to know about. So we've got our chemical, thermal, kinetic, gravitational, elastic, nuclear, electrostatic, and magnetic. So those are the eight stores that we've actually got available to us. We do have certain equations that are related to those stores that will help you out. So for our thermal, then that's going to be one that we find on our delightful formula sheet. So remember, you get this in the exam. So what we've got on there then is our change in thermal energy at the very top there is the mass times specific heat capacity times our temperature change. So that one's given to you. That's quite nice. For the kinetic, then that's when we need to actually learn. So kinetic energy is 0.5 times the mass times the speed squared. Gravitational, then that's mass times gravi gravitational field strength times height. Your elastic is 0.5 times the spring constant times the extension squared. Again, it's on our sheet. Oh, well, there we go. That one there, I do believe it is. And then our nuclear is going to be your energy is the mass times the velocity of light squared. So there's certain equations we can associate with those, first of all. When we've got energy in a store, it doesn't stay in just one store. We transfer it to others. And we've got four ways that we can do that transfer. It could be mechanical, electrical, heating by particles, or heating by radiation. And we can then calculate those transfers using a couple of equations again. So if it's a mechanical transfer, we're looking at work done. So work done, force times distance. If it's an electrical transfer, then that's going to be our power times time calculation. So what we then find is that when we're starting off with energy in one store, the amount of energy we start with here is going to be the same as the amount of energy we end with in whatever stores it's transferred into. Because we're going back to the law of conservation of energy, which tells us that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transferred between the stores. So if we've got what's called a closed system, there is no net change in energy. If you start with 100 joules, you end with 100 joules. In terms of how we actually analyze this then, we would carry out something called an energy analysis. So to all intents and purposes, we're drawing rectangles with lines to represent the amount of energy. So don't be sort of too fooled into thinking it's overly complicated. 
Now, in order to do this, we're going to start off by choosing our two points. Now, I say choosing, they're going to tell you your two points if they have a question on this. So they will tell you what the start scenario is and what the end scenario is. What you then need to do from that information is identify which stores have more or less energy in them at those two points they've given you. So what energy stores are we talking about and how much energy do we have at that start point and at the end point? Then what we're going to do is work out how the energy has been transferred from one to the other. So what we're actually going to end up drawing then is something like this. So this is our energy analysis diagram. As I said, it's boxes with lines. So we'd start off in an example of a race. So we've got the start of the race. We've got lots of energy in the chemical store. That's our fuel. And the vehicle is at a standstill. So kinetic store is empty because it's not moving. We're then going to see a mechanical transfer, which is then going to mean that the amount of fuel, therefore our chemical store, will decrease, but the kinetic will increase because the vehicle will be moving at the end. So we can see that we've gone from lots of energy in the chemical store to less, and from nothing in the kinetic to more. Obviously, that's not the full picture because we also have thermal store involved because we're going to be generating some heat and so forth. So what we find is that we've got our chemical store, kinetic store, and thermal store, and then we just put the same into place as to how it's going to change at the end of the race. Now, the one thing to bear in mind is that when we're actually drawing these, because we've obviously said that law of conservation of energy tells us that we're neither creating nor destroying, then the total height on the left-hand side must equal the total height of them all on the right-hand side. So don't obviously just draw them all up near the top because it's clearly going to be wrong. So just think about that one in case they give it to you. They could very well in this section ask you to do a range of calculations associated with this. And this is where you could potentially be asked to pull on a number of different formulae that are used in the earlier topics in order to do that. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the potential scenarios here because, as I said, there are so many that they could phrase it as. So if you're not sure on these calculations, then have a little look at the energy analysis videos that I've got on the channel just to go through them in turn. Now, what we actually find is that when we're transferring energy, then we need to think about what's the store at the beginning. And one of those that you really should remember then is the fact that if we talk about batteries, then that is a chemical store. OK, so just bear that one in mind, because it's one that people quite frequently get wrong. If we're talking about a power plant being at the beginning, it's either going to be a chemical or a nuclear store. Obviously, if it's a fossil fuel power plant, then it's going to be a chemical store. If it's a nuclear power plant, nuclear store. And then just think about how it's going to be transferred. Next thing we need to know then is all about power ratings. So what we've actually got then is that on every electrical device that exists, there will be a power rating, which will either be in watts or in kilowatts. Now, power quite simply is the rate of transfer of energy or work done over time. So what we then find is that if you've got a device that's got a high power rating, then that means that it's going to need quite a lot of fuel to actually run it and a lot more than a lower powered device would. In terms of what this means for us, then we do have cost implications. So this is where your electricity companies work out what they're going to bill you. So electricity uses what's called the kilowatt hour as the unit of energy. So a unit, quite simply, is the energy transferred by a one kilowatt appliance when it's on for one hour, hence kilowatt hour. And what we'd actually do to work that out then is your work done in kilowatt hours is the power in kilowatts times the time in hours. Now, kilo obviously is just times a thousand watts. So if you've got watts and you need it to be in kilowatts, then obviously we're just going to be changing using timesing and dividing by thousands. Now, if you're asked to work out power, then again, this might not just be given to you as a case of calculate the work done, because they could very well just give you things like the other units, and then you have to do multi-step calculations. So bear this one in mind that sometimes not just a single formula you've got to use, but two. Once you've actually worked out the work done in your kilowatt hours, then they will tell you the cost per unit. And usually it's about 10 pence they tend to use, but they will tell you in the question, the cost per unit is this. 
work out how much it costs to run this appliance for however long. So you calculate your work done, you then times that by the cost per unit, and you've got how much it actually costs to run. Now, what we're going to go on to next is this idea of dissipation. So when we're talking about dissipation, what we're referring to is the transfer of energy to stores that are not useful. So they're ones that we can't use for either working or heating. So what we might find here is something like in your car engine, obviously the parts move and therefore rub together and we have friction. So what we see is the parts of your engine heat up. So we're transferring energy to the thermal store of the engine parts, which doesn't make your car go anywhere. It's not being used for anything useful at that point. But wherever the energy ends up as this interim, then ultimately it's going to end up in the thermal store of the surroundings. Now, we don't want to obviously have a lot of our energy dissipating to the surroundings because that's no good to us. We're wasting it then. So what we actually do is we're going to try to reduce this. Two ways we do that. We can lubricate items, which is then going to reduce the dissipation by friction, or we can insulate items to reduce dissipation by heating. So you're just thinking about the given scenario and therefore, which is going to be better? Are we going to lubricate, so adding oil, etc., or are we going to insulate it by using some kind of insulation? In terms of insulation, then this is where we're coming on to the joy of building houses. So what we hopefully have as some kind of a basic understanding of what your house is, is that you've obviously got walls on your house. Now, depending on what type of house you've got, it will either be a solid wall and therefore just literally bricks and nothing else. Or on a more modern house, we have something called a cavity wall. So you've got an internal wall, a gap, and then another wall on the outside. Now, what we actually find then is as a result of these types of walls, we're going to have an effect on the energy that's being transmitted from inside our house to outside. So it's going to affect how well our houses retain the heat we use to actually keep them warm in the winter. So what we find then is that if we are actually looking at these, a solid brick wall is not going to be as good as an insulated cavity wall at retaining the heat inside your house. And if we're thinking about some of the other factors, the thicker your wall, then the better it is at keeping the heat inside because it's going to take longer to transfer that energy from inside to outside. So there's a few things we can consider here. One of the important ones is something called thermal conductivity. Now, the thermal conductivity of a material tells you the rate at which it transfers energy. So what we're really looking at here is that you want something to have a low thermal conductivity, because that means it's transferring only a very small amount of energy. So don't be fooled into looking at a table and picking the highest number for this, because that's going to be pretty rubbish insulation at that point. So have a little look at the information they give you and then pick the right insulation. If they're asking you about how you can reduce heating bills, then think about the different insulations we can put in your house. So cavity wall insulation, loft insulations, double glazing, any of those will apply because it's all going to reduce the rate at which the energy is transferred from inside your house to the surroundings outside. We do have our next little calculation, which is all about efficiency next. And when we're thinking about any device that we're using, we want it to be as efficient as possible because an efficient device is better at transferring energy between the stores to do the job that we want it to do. So efficiency then is your useful output energy divided by the input energy times 100. So you could be given our little Sankey diagram here. They could also, if they're being harsh, ask you to draw one of these. So we start off with this width here of our arrow, which shows us our input energy. And then we've got our output over here. And again, the width of these two adds up to this total width here. So if they were to ask you to draw one of these, they'd give you a bit of graph paper pre-printed. So think about your scale. Width of your first one must then obviously be the same as the total width of your others being given off and label it up properly. So remember, the width shows the amount of energy there. If you're doing the higher tier, then you need to know about how we can increase the efficiency. So to increase efficiency, we need to reduce wasted energy. So a few ways we can do that. First one, as we've already mentioned, insulate things, because if we're insulating, we're preventing that transfer to the surroundings. 
Secondly, we can use materials that reduce the unwanted energy transfer in the first instance, or we could use improved technology. So rather than the traditional light bulbs, we can use LED light bulbs instead. And the reason that we're so concerned with using more efficient devices is because they're actually able to operate at a lower power. And that means that they're going to use fuels more slowly, which then ties all the way back into the different fossil fuels we're using and therefore also things like climate change. Back for everyone, so combined physics foundation and higher folks, we're on to our final topic now of global challenges. Now, the first thing that we come on to in this topic is looking at how we can actually work out the speeds of things. And this is one of those topics that they could ask you perhaps one of the most obvious questions ever, and yet people still get it wrong, which can be as easy as how can we measure the time and how can we measure the distance that something moves? So hopefully if we're talking about times, then it's things like a stopwatch that we can use for that. If we're talking distances, tape measures are working. If we're looking at an upgrade on this, we can go into obviously our light gates. So think about where they're actually asking us to apply this knowledge, because we're not going to sit there and suggest that we use a tape measure if we're talking about a car driving many miles. That would be pretty stupid. So we can obviously just use the actual car because it's got the actual mileage on there. So you could use that to work out distance. A device won't be 100% efficient because we are transferring energy to something. We will waste something at some point, whether it be through heating, etc. So it's highly unlikely that you are going to have a 100% efficient device. What we then come back to is our little calculation of speed, which hopefully you already learned for your maths and earlier science papers. Speed is distance divided by time. So what we actually find here, that's our first calculation they could throw in but we could also be talking about acceleration. So that's your change in speed divided by time. Two words they might use in these kind of questions, precise, first of all, which is data that's got a small range when it's repeated, and accurate just means that the value you've got is close to the true value. So just be mindful of those two. Now, one thing that you are expected to know, which is a bit of a strange thing that they expect you to know these days are typical speeds of certain items because they could ask you to carry out estimates now they would give you a certain amount of information but they would expect you to know a typical speed to then use in these scenarios they're not going to tell you this so i'd suggest you learn a few something like a person walking is about one meter per second whereas someone who's running is five meters per second because if you've learned three or four of these, then you can actually kind of work out what the others would be in comparison. So learn a couple of slow and a couple of faster ones, and then you could get a pretty good estimate of anything in between. What we then come on to is the idea of reaction times. So a reaction time is the time taken from seeing something to the reaction occurring. Now, what we're actually going to find is that for an average human, then that's about 0.2 seconds. And you probably did this practical where you had a ruler, you had your hand, and then you dropped it and tried to catch it. And obviously the distance it traveled, you then used a little chart that told you what that time actually became. So what we find here is your reaction time is going to be something that is important when we come on to think about vehicles. So when we're thinking about vehicles, the first thing we need to know is the thinking distance. So one thing that we need to put into our definition here is the word distance. It never ceases to amaze me how many times people write a definition for thinking distance without using the word distance anywhere in it. So your thinking distance is the distance traveled in the time it takes from seeing a potential problem to starting to apply the brake. So getting your foot on that brake pedal and beginning to put the pressure there. So what we actually find then is thinking distance is going to be affected by things that affect you as an individual. So when they ask you what factors could increase the thinking distance, then think about what factors are going to affect someone's reaction time, the person. Drinking alcohol, using drugs, being tired, distractions, eating, drinking, using a sat nav, using a mobile phone, or an increased speed. Key thing here 
if they ask you to give two, then quite often what you're going to find is that in the question itself, they will have said, other than increase speed, give two, okay? Now, don't write speed again, okay? You've got to give something other than speed. And also be mindful of putting down drinking alcohol and using drugs as two different ones. They tend to be associated as the same marking point. So you'd only get one for those two answers. So I'd suggest that you would say drinking alcohol and being tired, for example. So it's two different categories, if that makes sense. We then have our second one, which is the braking distance. Now, braking distance is the distance traveled in the time it takes from putting your foot on the brake to coming to a complete stop. Again, keyword distance. And we could again be asked for factors that would increase the braking distance. Now, the key thing here, again, look out for the one they've already included in the question, don't write it again. But you've also got to specify how it's going to be impacting. Now, what we tend to find is they would ask you for two factors that would increase the braking distance. And a lot of people tend to write down things like the condition of the tires, the condition of the brakes. Wrong. Because just the condition doesn't actually tell us that it's going to increase the braking distance. Because the condition might be that you have excellent brakes. That's certainly not going to increase your braking distance. So you need to say icy roads, wet roads, poor brake condition, poor tire condition. But when we're thinking braking distance, it's all associated with the vehicle or the road. So thinking distance, the person, braking distance, the car or the road. What we then can generate is something called the stopping distance. So what we actually have there is your stopping distance is the total distance traveled from the moment the driver sees a problem to coming to a complete stop. So basically it's the thinking distance plus the braking distance. And when you learn to drive, which next year, folks, then you will have to learn this thing from the highway code. So this is your little chart that shows you your stopping distances and therefore informs you about how far from the car in front you should actually be driving. So you've got two bits, the blue bits, those are actually your thinking distances, and the red bits, those are the braking distances, which when we add them up, gives us our total stopping distance over here. Now, what we will see is that when you look at the thinking distance, then that increases in a linear fashion. So what you find is that if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, then it's a nine meter thinking distance, whereas at 50 miles an hour, which is 20 miles an hour more, then that's up to 15 meters. So what we find is for every 10 miles an hour, then it's a three meter increase in your thinking distance. We now need to think about basically car crashes. It's a very delightful topic. So what we actually find is that when you're in a collision in a car, then we need to think about what's happening as the vehicle comes to a dramatic stop. So one thing that hopefully you all do anytime you get into a vehicle is you put a seatbelt on. Now, the whole idea behind the seatbelt is that when the car comes to that sudden stop in a crash, then you're not going to come to a sudden stop as you hit the windscreen or the dashboard or the seat in front of you, etc. What the seatbelt actually does is it's made of a slightly stretchy material because what's going to happen is as the car comes to stop, you keep moving forward initially and it's going to bring you to a slightly slower stop as you move forward. The seatbelt then stretches that teeny little bit. It just brings you to a slightly slower stop at that point. Now, that means you've got a much smaller force acting on your body, reducing the risk of injuries. If obviously you're not wearing a seatbelt and the car comes to a sudden stop, you keep going at the speed the car was going at until something does stop you. And generally at that point, and it's going to be something pretty solid, it's not going to have much give in it, then you come to a very quick stop, which means there's a massive force acting on your body and it ends very messily. Hence, seatbelts. Do bear in mind that in the case of a collision, then seatbelts do need replacing because after that they have been stretched and therefore they will not carry out that function a second time. What we need to consider though is that seatbelts aren't perfect. You are still coming to a relatively quick stop there 
which means that you are still having quite a large negative acceleration. So what we can get are things called compression injuries from the actual seatbelt itself, or we could get internal injuries to our organs as your organs basically keep moving and then collide with things like your rib cage. So it's not a guarantee you're going to be fine, hence why we obviously have speed limits on the roads to try to minimise the issues in terms of a collision. If you're doing the higher tier paper, either combined or physics, we need to know the calculation forces mass times acceleration. We do need to hopefully remember that on our motorways, we should be driving a maximum of 70 miles an hour here in the UK. And the idea being that that's going to theoretically stop too many people dying in collisions on our motorways. So what we actually find is that the force that you're going to experience, mass times acceleration, remember, that is going to be dependent on the time it takes for that collision. So if we've got some kind of a technique built into the car that's going to increase the time of the collision, then it's better for you as an occupant of the vehicle because the longer it takes, then the lower that force will be and the reduction in the injuries will occur. So what we find there is we will have things like crumple zones here. So right, crumple zones are here. So with the crumple zone, what we've actually done on more modern cars is we've designed them to squish up in case of accident. So old cars were pretty solid things. You hit something and it was all going to give the same way. Modern cars, we've actually used different metals in different regions so that when you collide, the front of the car actually folds up. So hence crumple because it's going to squish up and it's going to do so in a controlled fashion and over a longer period of time than just something very solid hitting a surface and not having that give. So what we see is in that crumple zone, it will all move forward and it will all squash together, which means that that vehicle is coming to a slower stop, which reduces the force acting on you in the car. We can also have airbags in our car. Again, the idea there being that rather than hitting a steering wheel, which is a very dramatic and sudden stop, instead you hit a bag which has that little bit of give and therefore gives you that increased time to come to a stop, reducing the forces. So any of these particular safety features in the car, it's all about increasing the time to come to that stop so it reduces the force acting on you as the occupant. Back for everyone then, so the energy sources, which is for combined physics, higher and foundation folks, then what we need to know about are what energy sources we have. So an energy source is something we can use for heating, transportation or generating electricity, basically. And they will either be renewable or non-renewable. So renewable are the ones that will not run out. The non-renewable are the ones that will run out because we're using them at a rate faster than they are being made. So your renewable ones are biofuels, solar, tides, wind, waves, geothermal and hydroelectric, whereas your non-renewable are nuclear fuels and the fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Now, the nuclear fuels were actually formed in stars, hence why we're not making them anytime soon, folks. And fossil fuels were formed from the effects of pressure and temperature on the remains of things that lived many millions of years ago and have been buried underground. If we're actually thinking about these different energy sources, then, as we said, we're going to use them for heating, transportation or generating electricity. And they could ask you a question as to which is the best source to use for something. Just think about what the scenario is, what the location of it is, and therefore you can then select which one works based on those key features that hopefully you know about it. Now, if we're thinking about something that's in the middle of nowhere, so the middle of a desert, then we're not going to be selecting something that uses a fossil fuel. You would select solar instead. So you can just justify your answer based on those key features about them. If they ask you why our use of energy sources has changed over the years, then first and foremost, we can throw in the increase in human population, because obviously the more people there are, the greater the energy demands actually are. And we can also put in the fact that all of these extra people are also using a large number of devices as well. Another word they could throw in here while we're talking about fossil fuels is the word finite. So if something is finite, that just means that there is a fixed amount of it. So it will run out. 
So this is what we're talking about with our fossil fuels, that there is a fixed amount available to us in the world and therefore they will run out. Obviously, big downside of our fossil fuels is they produce carbon dioxide as they burn, ties back into your chemistry in terms of climate change. In terms of our climate change, do remember that we've got the issues of the ice caps will melt, sea levels will rise, we'll get flooding, we'll get the more extreme weather events, and then also threats to food supplies because we can have droughts in some areas, flooding in other areas, won't be enough food to feed our ever-increasing population. When it comes to actually deciding what energy source a government should use, three kind of key factors that we should really consider. First of all, how much is it going to cost? Because you don't want to spend a fortune. Secondly, what's your environmental impact going to be? If it's generating tons of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, etc., we don't really want that one. And finally, how long will those sources last? You're not going to spend millions investing in this infrastructure if it's a source that's going to run out in 50 years. That's stupid. We want something that's going to last a lot longer. Now, what we actually find then is in our UK system, we've obviously got our power stations, we've got our homes. You don't have a power station in your back garden, yeah, in most cases anyway. So what we need to do is then transport that electricity from the power station to your homes through the national grid. So the national grid is that series of power stations, pylons and cables that transmits electricity right the way across the country. Now, when we're looking at the national grid, we've got our power station over here where we actually generate the electricity. It then goes into our little transformer, which is a step up transformer because we're going to increase our voltage. So it can then be transmitted through the grid network at a high voltage to reduce the energy losses. When it gets to where we need it to be, it goes into a step down transformer. We decrease the voltage to the safe levels for use in our homes. One point that we need to bear in mind is that if they ask you why we increase the voltage for transmission through the national grid, then don't say that it prevents energy loss. You just need to talk about the fact it reduces the energy losses. So if you say that there will be no energy loss, you're not getting the mark. If you say it reduces energy losses, you will get the mark. Transformers is our next Fun little bit. I know you all love transformers so much. So transformers are the things that are going to change the voltage or the potential difference to reduce that heating effect. So step up, increase, step down, decrease it. And it's this thing. So we've got the iron core here. We've then got the primary coil and the secondary coil. So we've got a coil of wire wrapped around one side and a coil of wire wrapped around the other side. Now, what we actually find if you're doing the physics higher tier, only for you guys now, then what we're talking about as the point of this is to actually reduce the energy loss to the surroundings. Because if wires heat up as a result of resistance, then we're generating heat, which is then going to be transferred to the surroundings. And as a result of that, less electricity makes it to your home. That's not great because that means we have to burn more fossil fuels, more pollution, etc. So the amount of heating that we actually get is dependent on two things, the current and the resistance. So the more energy we lose in transmission, the more fossil fuels we burn, the more climate change we're then going to bring on, and the less energy we're actually going to have reaching our homes initially. So we're going to try to reduce that heating effect. And the way we do that is by increasing that potential difference or the voltage. So we can do that quite easily with the use of our transformers step up transformer, increase it nice and quickly to therefore reduce the energy loss in transmission. So that's why we have the high voltage in the national grid. Now, one of the things that they could very well ask you to use is your voltage in the primary coil times the current in your primary coil is the voltage in the secondary times the current in the secondary. So just bear that little formula in mind. You can obviously rearrange it to solve whichever bit they've missed out there. Still, for the higher physics folks only, then you could be asked to do some calculations on this so that when we're actually looking at this current being induced in the wires and they're heating up, we're transferring that energy to thermal store of the surroundings. So they could ask you to compare the two different potential differences and therefore select which one is better. So that could be a multi step calculation looking at obviously your current, which is your 
actual PD divided. Hold on, sorry. No, sorry. Your current obviously is looking at P divided by V. Your power wastage, so your current squared times resistance. And obviously then you can calculate your total power using all of the information that you've got. I'm hoping they're not going to be that mean, but we never know. The last bit, I believe, for the combined science folks, if my memory serves, is about mains electricity. So mains electricity, hopefully we know in the UK, has a voltage of 230 volts. So what we're actually going to have then are two different kinds of electricity we can have. We can have what's called an alternating current, which is the one that's got a little wavy line up and down. And we've got direct, which is going to be the horizontal line. So if we're talking about a battery, it's direct. If we're talking about your mains, it's alternating. One thing that you probably did as a practical was playing around with wiring a plug. Now they could ask you to actually name these different wires and their colors. So hopefully we do remember that when we're talking about the blue wire here, that's your neutral. The yellow and green stripy one is the earth and the brown one is the live. You've also got this bit here, which is your fuse in the plug, which is all to do with basically being a safety feature. So what we find in terms of our plugs then is when we've actually got this all wired up correctly, then the live and the neutral wire make a complete circuit with your appliance and the earth wire is connected to earth. So on your homes somewhere, hopefully, you have actually got a mains earth connection. So you've got a connection going from your main circuit board to earth. So it's going to carry that away from your house, making it safe. If you don't, you need to get one, as I found out recently. Now, what we actually have here then is if we connect our voltmeter between different wires, we're going to get a different reading on our voltmeter. So if you connect a voltmeter between the live and the neutral, then it will read 230. If you connect between the live and the earth, 230. If you connect between the neutral and the earth, then what we have is zero. Because obviously neutral gives you a bit of a hint there, and the earth, as we know, is just carrying anything away. For our safety features then, we don't want a scenario where your live wire, which is obviously carrying that 230 volts, can touch a metal casing which you can touch. That just leads to sudden death due to electrocution. So what we actually find then is if that live wire comes loose and touches a metal case, that's a danger. So what we have is the earth wire that connects onto the case and our earth pole so that if the current is flowing into that case, it's going to carry it down the earth wire and away because the earth wire has less resistance than you do. So it will flow through the path of least resistance. We've also got the fuse, as we said, as a safety feature in there, because in the fuse, we've got this very thin little strip of wire that's going to melt in the case of too much current flowing through, which breaks the circuit and stops the current flowing. The only other one we could see is something called a double insulated appliance, which basically has a plastic casing so that no current can actually flow through the case to you. And if it's double insulated, it doesn't need an earth because there's no way the live wire can actually touch anything that could transmit to you. If you're doing combined science, you are now done because the last bit is only for those of you doing GCSE physics, where we're going into space and looking at the structure of the Earth. So combined science, folks, good luck for tomorrow. Don't forget to take a calculator. This is a physics paper after all. And make sure you read the questions carefully, show any working in calculations, because even if you make a mistake right at the end, you'll get the marks for your actual working if you've shown it. So write the formula first of all, substitute in, rearrange, showing each and every one of those steps, and then write the correct answer on the answer line. Other than that, good luck, and hopefully you found these useful for you. GCSE physics folks then, on to the big bang. So quick history of the universe first of all. We haven't always had this idea of the big bang theory. Ideas have changed over time as we've developed new technology, as we've obviously made new discoveries and come up with new understandings of how things work. So these ideas about the universe have changed from when Aristotle was sitting there in 400 BC thinking that the Earth was the center of the universe because he basically sat there as the ancient Greeks did in their togas stroking their beards and thinking, hmm, what is this? And his idea was the Earth was the center of the universe. They didn't have telescopes. They didn't have all this other understanding. 
since then, we've obviously come up with a lot more. We've made more observations. We've recorded a lot more things. And then we've come up with creative ideas to explain these observations, which is where we actually come up with the Big Bang. Now, the Big Bang theory, quite simply, not the TV show that just finished, but is all about the idea that the universe itself started as something very dense and very tiny. When I say tiny, I mean smaller than an atom. So really, really tiny is where we're starting. And about 13.7 billion years ago, it underwent this sudden and rapid expansion. That's what we mean by the Big Bang. OK, so we're starting off from something incredibly tiny and dense and all of a sudden universe. So what we actually have here then is something that says, first and foremost, we on planet Earth, are not the center of the universe. So for those people who still act like they're the center of the universe, they are very sadly mistaken. We are not the center of it at all. And what we also know is that the space between all of these galaxies that make up our universe is expanding. So it's not a case of the universe is a fixed size and that's it. We are still seeing expansion of the universe and galaxies moving further and further away from each other. The reason we can state that we know this and the Big Bang theory is now the widely accepted theory is because of two key bits of evidence. CMBR, which stands for Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, and Redshift. If we do CMBR first of all, so the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, then this was an idea that came into fruition in the 1960s. And what we actually found was that no matter where we actually pointed our telescopes, where we were getting these readings, then microwave radiation came from all directions. So literally wherever we were looking, we found microwave radiation. And what the scientists worked out is that this was the radiation that was left over from the Big Bang itself. So what we can actually say from that is that the very high energy and high frequency radiation that began at the big point of the Big Bang has actually been stretched over time. And now it resides in the microwave region of our electromagnetic spectrum. So what we see is where we had that really high frequency, then it stretched it. So the wavelength has obviously got longer. And as we know, the electromagnetic spectrum is just looking at the different wavelengths. And therefore, it's now in the microwave region. So that's our first bit of evidence. Redshift then is coming onto the work of Edwin Hubble. So what we actually find is that we can measure the speed of galaxies using the absorption spectrum of the light they're emitting. And that's what Hubble did. He actually looked at distant galaxies and he looked at the absorption spectrums of light that they emitted. So from that, what they were going to do is have a look and see what was happening. What wavelengths were we actually getting? Now, when a light source is moving away from us, then the wavelength of the light it emits is increasing. So it's moving into the red end of our spectrum because red light has a wavelength of up 700 nanometers. So what we're seeing there is if we're increasing the wavelength itself, we're moving it to the red end of the visible spectrum, hence redshift. If the light source was moving towards us, then what's actually happening is it's going to be shifting that wavelength to the blue end of the spectrum, and that would be our blue shift. So what we can actually see just by looking to see is the light from these distant galaxies being red shifted or blue shifted, we can work out are they moving away from us or towards us. And what we saw was that these galaxies were moving away. They were demonstrating this red shift. So Hubble actually used redshift to work out that those galaxies were moving away from us and that the more distant a galaxy was, the faster it moved away from us. So this gave us the idea that our universe is actually still expanding and all of the galaxies that make it up are still moving away from each other. The ones furthest away moving away at an even faster rate than those that are closest to us. Next thing we need to know about then is what our solar system actually is. So our solar system itself is good old Milky Way. Now, within our solar system, we've actually got the sun. OK, so that's our personal star, part of all the stars that make up our galaxy in the Milky Way, our little solar system, that tiny little bit on the edge of it. OK, so our sun is a star. 
and when you look up in the night sky, all of those stars you can see, those are potentially suns of other planets and other worlds. So our solar system, the sun, first of all, our star. We've got the planets. Hopefully we do remember them all. So hopefully you've got a little mnemonic that you've helped remember the actual order in which they go from the actual sun itself moving further out. Don't forget, Pluto is not a planet. It is a dwarf planet, so we don't categorize it as a proper planet anymore. We then have the moons, which orbit around the planets themselves. Some of us, like us, only one moon. Others, many, many moons. We've got the minor planets, which is anything that's neither a planet or a comet that orbits around the sun. So this is things like our dwarf planets. And then we've got our comets, which are the things that are made of ice and dust that orbit the sun. So what we actually find then is if we think about the planets within our little solar system, our little corner of this giant universe, then the inner planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. So four inner planets, which basically goes up to Mars. All of those inner planets are rocky planets and they've got an atmosphere of some kind. They're not identical, though. They do have some key differences here. So if we look at Mercury and Mars, they've got incredibly thin atmospheres. If we look at Venus, then that one has an atmosphere that's pretty much carbon dioxide. And it's not like rain that's falling is like our rain. It's pretty much raining sulfuric acid on you. So not particularly hospitable for life. We've also got different numbers of moons. We on Earth have our single natural satellite of a moon. Mars has two, Mercury and Venus just have no moons, bless them. We then move to the outer planets, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And what we've actually got there, Jupiter and Saturn are what's called gas giant and Uranus and Neptune are the ice giants, but they're huge. That's the key thing about these planets. They've got rings, they've got lots of moons and they're just out there quite a way away from the sun. Now, what we also have to consider is something called the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt is located between Mars and Jupiter. Now, if we're talking about an asteroid, that's a piece of rock that's left over from the formation of our solar system. So what we actually had at the beginning were all these bits of rock that due to gravity were pulled together and eventually formed the planets as we know them. Between Mars and Jupiter, though, we did not get another planet. And the reason for that is that the actual gravitational pull of Jupiter particularly, because it is so vast, was actually pulling those bits away. So it prevented those asteroids coming together to form another planet. So we've got this belt, this big band of all of these bits of rock left over from the formation of the solar system. We also need to know about how the sun formed. Now, the sun itself is a star and stars are basically big balls of dust and gas. So what we actually had originally was this huge cloud of dust and gas that was pulled together by gravity. So gravity between all those little bits of dust and gas, pulling them closer and closer together. And as they got closer together, then the core of this gets really hot. So eventually these particles are moving fast enough due to the increasing temperatures to get nuclear fusion. If you remember what we said when we're looking at fusion, then in order for those things to come together and join, then it needs to be hot enough and have high enough pressure. So we got a really hot core and fusion begins. What we then find is as a result of all of this fusion, we end up with a balance between the gravity pulling particles inwards and as we're getting these hot gases, they start to expand because as you increase the temperature, then we get expansion occurring. So the hot gases are pushing outwards, gravity is pulling inwards, and we get to this point where it's this lovely little balance between those two, and we sit in this nice, stable part of our star's life. And lucky for us, that's where our sun actually is currently. It's in the stable part of its existence. Now, we do need to know the full life cycle of stars. So the formation, first of all, is the same, whether it's a little star, whether it's a big star, formation is identical for both. So we start off with our huge cloud of gas, which is mainly hydrogen, called a nebula, and that's the bit that's pulled together by gravity. So step one, nebula. 
once we've actually got that nebula being pulled together by gravity, we get that large ball of gas forming at the centre. And as it gets denser, then obviously gravity will increase, more gas gets pulled in, and it gets hotter and hotter and forms something called a protostar. That protostar continues to grow and get bigger as more and more gas gets pulled into it until nuclear fusion occurs. When that nuclear fusion occurs, that's our balance between gravity pulling in and the gas is pushing out. And this is called the main sequence star. So it's the main sequence part of its life. That's where it's stable. And that's where our sun currently is. Now, it will stay there potentially for millions of years. So it can stay in that main sequence for a really, really long time. When we come on to the death phase of our star, it's all about the mass as to what's going to happen. So if we consider small stars, first of all, and our little sun, bless it, is actually classed as a small star, then the first thing that happens is as we run out of that hydrogen to go through that fusion reaction, then what we find is it cools down. And when it cools, it actually expands into this thing called a red giant. The outer layers of that will then break away and form a new planetary nebula made up of all this gas. And then the very center, we've got this white hot core that's left, which is called a white dwarf. And over time, that white dwarf is going to cool down and just fade away. If we've got a large star, though, this is a little bit more spectacular. So the first thing that happens is it expands and cools, but because they're larger, then they become what's called a red supergiant. So they get bigger. And we'll also see the potential for it to explode as a supernova. So this massive galactic explosion. During that supernova, what actually happens is the very core of the star gets crushed down by these huge gravitational forces to form this really dense star made of neutrons. And the name for that is quite obvious. It's called a neutron star. That neutron star is actually something that spins really quickly. So neutron stars are actually quite cool because you can listen to a neutron star. Because as it's spinning, it's actually sending these pulses of radio waves where we can actually pick them up. So you can actually find videos if you really want to and listen to neutron stars. And the different neutron stars, depending on their spinning, sound different. So you can listen to stars if you want to. If we've got a very, very, very big star, then what happens is that core getting crushed down won't actually form that neutron star. Instead, it gets crushed down to this tiny space, which is a black hole. And black holes have this immense force of gravity that's actually so strong that even light can't escape it. Hence, black hole. And as we know, we can't actually see a black hole because obviously light can't escape. So you can't see something if light can't escape it. If you're doing higher tier physics, then we need to know about satellites and orbits. So when we're talking about satellites, they can either be natural or artificial. So our moon is a natural satellite. We didn't put it there. It just was there. And we've got artificial satellites the ones we as humans have chucked up into orbit. Now, natural satellites are made of the same material as the rest of the objects in the solar system, whereas artificial ones are obviously made of things that we've created, so lots of metal goes into those ones. In terms of our artificial satellites, then we've got two types of orbit that we use for them, geostationary or low polar orbit. So depending on what purpose we've got for our satellite, will determine whether we want it to be in a geostationary orbit or whether we want it to be in a low polar orbit. So a geostationary orbit, first of all, is one that's going to take 24 hours for a single orbit to occur. And that one is quite high. It's about 36,000 kilometers above Earth's surface. So it's quite a high orbit. The key thing about this one, though, is as the name suggests, geostationary, then it's going to remain in a fixed position above Earth's equator. So these are the ones we're going to use for things like satellite TV and communication, because we want that satellite to be in that one location so we can bounce the signals off it. The low polar orbit is the one that's a much shorter orbit time. So it takes about two hours for one orbit for these ones and they're much closer to Earth's surface, only about 2,000 kilometers up. The key thing about these is they orbit over the poles, 
And obviously, if they're going around every two hours, they're going to do this multiple times in a single day. So these are the ones we're using for more of the observations. So whether it's military, whether it's weather, all about observation, where we want a regular update, we'll use a low polar orbit for that one. If we've got something in orbit, then hopefully it will be in a stable orbit. For it to be in a stable orbit, the object has to be moving at the right speed for the distance from the object it is orbiting, i.e. the planet. If we move further from the sun, then the planets are actually moving slower. So they're obviously all in this orbit around the sun itself. And as we go further away from the sun, the planets move slower in order to keep them in that stable orbit. And the reason for that is that as we go further from the sun, the pull of gravity from the sun is going to be lower because it's obviously further away. And that means we've only got a small force changing its velocity. Now, if we then come on to consider the ideas of radiation and temperature, then hopefully we do know that all objects emit electromagnetic radiation. If we're talking about a warm object, it emits infrared radiation, which we can detect using those thermal imaging cameras we talked about earlier. And obviously the amount of radiation it's going to emit depends on how hot it actually is. So hotter objects emit more. If we're looking at the actual colors that we've got there, do remember that the hottest ones will actually look a bluish white color. Then we come down to the yellow and finally the cooler parts are actually red. So when we say something is red hot, that's not as hot as it can get at all. When we're thinking about the objects emitting this radiation, then hotter objects emit more radiation of a higher frequency and shorter wavelength. And they emit less radiation of lower frequency and longer wavelengths. So what we can do when we're looking at all these stars out in space, then what we can actually do is analyze the light that comes from those stars and plot a little graph of intensity of the radiation against their frequency. So what we can work out from that is that the hot stars have a higher frequency and a higher intensity. So that means that we can work out all about these different stars, how hot they are, and then we can plot a lot more about them. If we've got an object emitting the same amount of radiation as it's absorbing, then its temperature remains constant, won't change. If we've got an object that is going to be emitting more radiation than it absorbs, it cools down. And if it's absorbing more radiation than it's emitting, then it will obviously heat up. So just think about radiation in terms of changing the temperature there. That obviously ties in nicely with when we're thinking about the temperature here on Earth. And again, we've got a bit of an overlap with chemistry here. We do hopefully know that the Earth absorbs radiation from the sun and it emits radiation back into space. But the, our atmosphere is all about keeping some of that within Earth's atmosphere to keep us at the temperature that allows life to exist. A certain amount of the actual atmosphere is going to reflect radiation back down to the Earth itself and how much of that is going to be dependent on what the atmosphere is made of. So if we've got lots of greenhouse gases, so a higher concentration of greenhouse gases means that we're going to have more radiation being reflected back to Earth's surface. Hence, we get our climate change and the enhanced greenhouse effect as we looked at in chemistry. The very, very last thing that we need to do just for the higher tier physics folks is the structure of the Earth. So hopefully we know this bit. If you do geography, you certainly should. So we've got our four main areas, our divisions of the Earth. The outermost bit is the crust. Then we've got the mantle, the outer core and the inner core. So the four actual divisions of the Earth itself. Now, we haven't actually worked this out by getting a big old drill, drilling down and going, oh, look, that's this, because we can't do that. First of all, it's way too deep. Secondly, it gets pretty toasty inside the earth, so we wouldn't have equipment that could actually withstand those. Instead, what we do is we use earthquakes. So earthquakes will produce these things called seismic waves, and the seismic waves are detected on a device called a seismometer. The seismometer produces a thing called a seismogram, and that's basically a little graph of the waves being produced. And what it's actually looking at is the time and the intensity of two types of seismic wave. So the two types of seismic wave we've got then are the P waves, which are the primary waves, and the S waves, which are the secondary waves. 
What we find then is that if we look at the information we get from the earthquakes themselves, near the epicenter, so near where the earthquake originates, we will detect both S waves and P waves. However, if we've got seismometers around the Earth itself, we don't detect S waves and P waves everywhere. What we find is that there's certain regions of the Earth itself called shadow zones, where either S waves or P waves, or neither, will actually be detected. In order to understand this, we need to know a little bit more about those two types of seismic wave. So P waves, first of all, the primary, these are longitudinal waves, and they are able to travel through solids and liquids. The S waves, the secondary waves, these are transverse waves, and they only travel through a solid, so they can't travel through a liquid. So what we find is that when we have a little look and see what's detected on those different seismographs, then we can work out what it's traveling through. Because if we're actually able to detect both S waves and P waves, then quite clearly it's going through a solid. Whereas if we're only able to detect the P waves, then what we can say is that there must be a liquid somewhere between the epicenter of the earthquake and our device, because it's not able to travel through, therefore there must be some liquid between it. So this is how we worked out all the way back in 1936, that we've actually got the very center of the earth as a solid, the inner core there, but we have the liquid outer core. So by analysing our seismic waves, we've worked out the structure of the Earth itself. And that is it. We have now finished all of our physics. So same thing as I said to the combined folks, make sure that any of the calculations, you write down the formula you're going to use, you substitute in, you rearrange it and show all of that working. Then you type it into your calculator and actually write the answer at the end. Make sure that you read the questions carefully because sometimes OCR do like to give you answers in the actual question itself, and they give you some pretty clear pointers too. So make sure that you do attempt all of the questions. A blank space is guaranteed to get you no marks, whereas a guess, it might get you some marks. Worst case scenario, you entertain us as examiners if it's completely wrong anyway. So good luck for tomorrow, and when you finished, if that is your last exam, as I know for many of you it is, enjoy your longest summer of your life and hopefully your results in August will be good. So good luck for tomorrow everyone.